Hello and welcome to another episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie, brought to you by Killer Podcasts, an evergreen podcasts network. I'm the titular Sean. And I'm the very titular Carrie. It's the show that takes you inside the unbelievable, the unexplainable, the macabre, and the bizarre and tries to find an answer. Hello, Caroline. Hi. I'm giving you the warmest of smiles today because <laughs> um, we have a really exciting story on our hands today. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, we don't like to get too political on this show, and we've never endorsed a candidate before. Oh, boy. But, what? But if the topic of our episode today ever runs again, I think we're probably pot committed. I mean, once you hear his um, the planks of his platform, you're, you're going to be with me. Caroline, next week, and we'll talk about this more later in this show, we're going uh, way back in the past. Mm-hmm. And last week, we went even further back in the past. Mm-hmm. So this week, I wanted to give us a modern story, although we are going to dabble in history just a little bit, because this week we're talking about Andrew Baziago. Oh, boy. Self-avowed psychic, time traveler, friend to Bigfoots, <laughs> and once in future candidate for president of the United States. You said future. Does, does he have a claim that he will run again? Uh, yes. Uh, in, in fact, Andrew is certain that he will one day be elected president of the mm. United States. Um, sometime between now and 2028, but we'll get to that later. Okay, <laughs> time's running out. Andrew Baziago was born in 1961. He is 60 years old today. And Andrew has been publicly claiming since 2004, usually through appearances on the, um, you know, one of our favorite radio programs, Coast to Coast AM, mm -hmm. that from the ages of 7 to 12... He was a government agent working as part of an experimental research facility looking into teleportation and time travel, technologies that were successfully developed and which the, the U.S. government is hiding from the American people to this very day. So he was like a, a baby X-Files agent? Yes, that's almost exactly right. Okay. Uh, more like, like, again, from age 7 to 12. But yes, he was a baby. It was baby X-Files. X-Files babies. X-Files baby. <laughs> you know, just two big uh, uh, black slacked feet come into the frame and, and ask the kids what they're looking. Remember how that just the socks of the nanny would... Muppet anyway. babies? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> as far as we can tell, Andrew Baziago started submitting academic papers to the National Geographic Society in 2008 about buildings, forests, and alien creatures that he was seeing in f photos that the Mars rover had sent back from the red planet. So, the si you know, National Geographic also had access to these images, obviously, so did NASA, but um, Andrew was looking at him and going, no, I swear to you, I'm, I'll point it out. If you guys let me come over, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll point it out. I, there's alien creatures and buildings, Martian buildings on the moon. So 2008 is when he comes on the scene. Um, well, I, I think 2004 might be his first coast-to-coast -coast appearance. Oh. Where he told that he got into the whole time travel thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but he got into Mars about four years later. Um, National Geographic did decline to publish. Hmm. Basiago's claims first came to broader public attention in 2011 and 2012 when he was featured in Albert Lambremont Weber's uh, Exopolitics blog. Uh, Weber is a an American lawyer. I don't know where he lives, but he has this very extensive, very uh, frequently updated blog where he um, he's just very concerned with exopolitics, which is the political ramifications of uh, the government hiding alien life on Earth. Mm -hmm. After Weber wrote about it, it was somehow found and picked up by the Huffington Post. And uh, by this time, Baziago was throwing around the name of a certain... A uh, very popular recent president, and um, yep, the, I, yeah, that's right, Carrie. Barack Hussein <laughs> Obama is showing up. Oh, in this stop! <laughs> Good lord. No, President Obama shows up in this story, but uh, not until later. Hmm. First, we need to talk about Project Pegasus. Okay. Basiago says this was a DARPA program. Uh, DARPA, for those who don't know, is a real U.S. government agency. It's the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And this was a program instituted by DARPA from 1962 to 1972, where they developed technologies that allowed teleportation and both physical and holographic travel through time. Mm-hmm. 
Andrew says his father actually helped work on the technology while he was working at the Ralph M. Parsons Engineering Company. But there was no nepotism. I, I see the look on your face, Carrie. <laughs> I'm, I'm perfectly no, you're flat. Trying to, you're trying to take the wind out of Andrew's sails because obviously they just put him in this government program because his dad invented the technology. I mean, if you're going to test out any X-Files babies, might as well be your own, I guess. But actually, Andrew only became involved after some standardized testing at school determined that he was a psychic genius. A psychic genius. Oh, uh, yes. Andrew says his father had been noticing his special abilities from a very young age. And, and this will lead us to our first audio clip here. Uh, this is Andrew himself. I was picking up his thoughts and then saying things relative to what he was thinking. He also came out of the cellar one time into our rec room, which was on the ground floor of the house. And he saw me, it's not levitating, but just causing several of my small toys, my, my alphabet blocks and some tinker toys, to hover three feet off the ground. What I had done is pick them up and place them about three feet off the ground. And I was not only causing them to hover, but some of the toys were actually orbiting around each other in the way that our Earth orbit orbits the sun. I can only imagine Andrew was in the center of that solar system. Um, that's where he likes to be. Yeah, but why does standardized testing have to tell people you're a psychic if your dad can just vouch for you? And how does standardized, like what essay portion or reading comprehension uh, challenge did he take well, you, that you, said he was psychic? You remember the standardized testing uh, government mandate? Yeah, there was no occult section, I remember. No, I know, but you, you didn't recognize the kind of alpha level intelligence training that was being implemented. Um in these uh, uh, standardized tests. Standardized tests. It wasn't. It was the No Child Left Behind Act, which is bullshit. And that's why we did it. But No Child Left Behind wasn't around yet. These were a different round of standardized testing when uh, Baziago was a kid. And this was I guess this one wasn't psychic. This was for Project Talent, says Baziago. So there's a, there's a pre-project to Project Pegasus. Yes. Project Talent was to get talent, you see. I see. For Project Pegasus. Um. Yeah, they were a secret DARPA recruiting tool, obviously. So Andrew was sent to a special learning lab that very conveniently was right in his elementary school. So basically when you get to go to the, the like advanced reading group? Yes, sort of. <laughs> yes, sort of. In the fall of 1969, a couple months after the lunar landing of July 1969. And note, he, he, he throws in the lunar landing just to like, I don't know if he thinks that gives him an air of credibility <laughs> like why does he mention the moon landing uh, we, we know what 1969 is there weren't any psychic children on board as far as i can tell i was placed in a learning lab at my elementary school which was mount view road school in morris plains new jersey and we were immediately um, involved in a set of academic exercises in speed learning and different things that the intelligence community would identify as Alpha intelligence training. Exactly what I just said to you, Carrie. See, Andrew and I are on the same wavelength. And it's definitely not that I've been living in his head for the last five days. It's a little concerning. Oh, it's not been great on my mental health. <laughs> now, Baziago says students without super normal abilities were phased out of the program one by one as his new teachers introduced psychic games to test the children's latent powers. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, trying to guess a randomly selected playing card from a 52-card deck. It's a classic. And she would go around Robin for, let's say, 90 minutes or so with four or five of the children in the project. And I remember guessing the card correctly with one out of 52 odds for the whole session. Maybe getting one guess wrong. Maybe I would guess five of hearts versus five of diamonds. <laughs> Again, credibility. He's, he's mm -hmm. like, these are examples of cards. So, in addition to what I believe my father probably reported to the Department of Defense, that I was demonstrating um, special abilities like levitation and clairvoyance, I think I was identified as a pretty advanced psychic at that time, in the mm -hmm. beginning of, that, of that, that third grade school year. Pretty advanced psychic. Like, I'm not tooting my own horn, but I, th <laughs> I think they probably knew what they had on their heads. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, Baziago says he used eight different technologies while he was involved in this program to travel through time and space, both physically and holographically. 
mm-hmm. which I gather is kind of like an astral projection situation. I would assume so. Um, no, he, I've, I've read him describe it. I still just don't know what holographic, <laughs> at why he throws that in there. Anyway, uh, for most of his jumps, the technology was something that the U.S. government had cobbled together out of schematics found in the basement of the New York apartment of none other than Nikola Tesla. There he is. He always comes in somehow. Uh, conspiracy theorists love Tesla because, um, well, for those who don't know, Tesla was a genius inventor and scientist. He was a major uh, bitter rival to uh, Thomas Edison. Noted dick. Uh, <laughs> noted, uh, yeah. Well, Edison was at his most dickish in the current wars. Mm-hmm. between the DC direct current that Edison had gotten heavily behind and invested money in. And Tesla came along and said, well, it's kind of tough to adjust the voltage on it. It's a, What if we had, and he invented AC, alternating current, which is what the outlets in your home still have today. Mm-hmm. Um, Edison, trying to protect his own investments, uh, claimed that alternating current was dangerous. And in order to prove this, he would actually publicly electrocute animals to death uh, usually stray dogs, but in one case, an elephant, famously. Like I said, a dick. Um, the Chicago World's Fair was actually the major death knell for uh, direct current because Westinghouse underbid, I think it was General Electric, and powered the whole thing with Tesla's technology. And that kind of put the last nail in the coffin for Edison, who still made uh, all of the money off the movie industry for the first, uh, I think, 20 years that films were being made in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Anyway, after he retired, Tesla uh, apparently spent all of his time inventing secret teleportation and time travel technologies. Yeah, I've seen the prestige. And in 1943, the government found some of his blueprints. And this included a lot of work into, again, we're going off Basiago here, a lot of work into powerful, invisible, and omnipresent radiant energy that was born with the universe and suffuses all of us. So kind of like the force, I guess. Mm Mm-hmm. So Tesla discovered the force. You with me so far? Sure. So the machine that the government rigged up, that DARPA rigged up. That Basiago says they rigged up, right? Yeah, yeah, but I don't <laughs> see why he would lie. Right. I'm just I'm making sure we know that this is not in the public record or anything. Picture, if you will, <laughs> two eight-foot-tall parenthesis-shaped booms, mm-hmm. uh, 10 feet apart. And they were hooked up to some rudimentary computers, like I think rudimentary even for the time, and a single wall power cord, like <laughs> like you would plug a washing machine in, is what Basiago says powered the machine. Um, once it was turned on, radiant energy was channeled into a white space between the two um, booms, and you would jump into it to literally jump through time and space. Although... Andrew's first jump was only through space, uh, not through time, just as a test, a little test run. And uh, his dad was right there with him. And my dad explained that on the count of three, we would hold hands and jump through the energy pattern, the, this field of radiant energy. And we would find ourselves in a, an illuminated tunnel for several seconds. And then the tunnel would close and we would find ourselves, as he put it, on a hillside elsewhere in the United States. In fact, the hillside was the state capitol grounds in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And that was over 2,000 miles from where they had started. I'm going to assume that Mr. Basiago, uh, Andrew's dad, is not on the record about this at all and has not given any quotes about Project Pegasus. No, long dead. Yeah, I figured. Long dead before, uh, before Andrew started any of this. Yeah. Andrew says that in 2004, and it's not clear whether that was on a time jump to 2004 or when 2004 actually came, he says he met a lady who works in that state capitol building who says people show up there all the time. And so he kind of thinks there's just a natural nexus where random jumps may accidentally deposit in that kind of space and time I'm sure people show up to state capitol buildings all the time anyway. Yeah, but I think... I was about to say, I think they were in the basement, but I may have made that detail up. (laughs) Andrew's future jumps included short hops, just a few hours in time, to get used to the disorienting sensation of time travel. By the way, he says children were much better suited to those disorienting effects, like it it would drive adults just crazy or kill them. Uh, But children were better at withstanding these effects, and it was a little less dangerous. 
I'd still be a little pissed at my dad for being cool with this. Oh, you haven't even heard of the mishaps yet, Carrie. Oh, boy. Um, Andrew says, jumping one, quote, felt either as if one was moving at a great rate of speed or moving not at all, as the universe was wrapped around one's location. So that makes no fucking sense. <laughs> uh, now, not all of his jumps were time jumps, as we said. Uh, and the project seemed particularly interested in, in testing ways to send different children, multiple children, to the same location from multiple locations, from multiple different teleporters. Mm -hmm. And I guess this was for, like, espionage applications. Like, a bunch of children would be <laughs> sent into a facility to, like, you know, do a secret recon mission and steal a serum or something. Uh, that's a, a big risk you're taking with the lives of a bunch of chi uh, children, but okay. Well, again, you don't even know about the mishaps yet. And it's on one of these jumps that Andrew witnessed a uh, particularly gruesome thing that can happen with this technology, apparently. Because in one case, as they jumped into an abandoned middle school, a fellow student teleported into ankle-deep water in a nearby fountain. And Basiago says, and I'm not sure what this means, so if you can guide me, he says the specific gravity of the water caused the boy's feet to arrive a split second before the rest of his body. He was splinched. Le yes, just like in Harry Potter. Yes, if you... If, if you, you uh, apparate poorly, you lose little parts of your body. Mm -hmm. And that is just what happened, apparently, to this poor young agent. This is from a, uh, an interview he gave on YouTube, Mr. Basiaga. And so he slid off his ankles and oh. tumbled out of the fountain, Ugh. having been detached from his feet. <laughs> and when I reached his location, I had I had popped into view via the teleporter that I jumped through, and he clearly accessed that location from some other teleporter around the eastern United States. Clearly, he was writhing on the ground, screaming, "My feet! My feet! I'm only nine years old. What am I going to do without any feet?" <laughs> no, <laughs> no. I love that the boy has the presence of mind to go. My feet, my feet, I'm nine years old. What am I going to do without any... He's thinking of his whole life without on just on these stumps. <laughs> the the cut, he, he was detached from his feet is disgusting. It, it, what does he say? He slid off. He slid off his ankles. He slid, <laughs> bleh, <laughs> slid off his Jesus ankles. Jesus Christ. That's some Cronenberg shit. My feet, my feet, I'm only nine years old. Yeah, it's sad. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, the government wanted to use time travel. Now, obviously, they wanted to use teleportation to keep tabs. Because it's going so great. To keep tabs on the Ruskies using these children. But they wanted to use time travel to corroborate facts about history, particularly the lives of three especially important and well-referenced individuals. George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and Jesus. Oh. Je Jesus Christ. Okay. I mean, it's interesting that you wouldn't choose, like, figures we know less about. Why not send these kids back to meet Alexander? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. But it was an American project, I guess, so it makes sense that there's two, like, Americans in there. I feel there. like we know plenty about Lincoln. Oh, very well documented, yeah. Like, even Washington, but at least he's further back, but R I right. don't know. But a lot of these details, thankfully, were confirmed by Andrew Basiago in his face-to-face -face voyages to these men's lives. Thank God for that. That's right. He showed up with another modern child in George Washington's war tent on the Hudson during the Revolutionary War. It's a good thing he didn't land in the Hudson. He would have been detached from his feet. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, the specific gravity of water. You've got to watch out for that. And what I mean, if it's raining? What if there's a puddle? What if you just land like with the tent right down your body? You know what I mean? Like, like You're detached in half. You're, you, I'm halved! <laughs> I'm only nine years old. <laughs> what am I going to do with only one hand? <laughs> Basiago says Washington, who was obviously an educated, wealthy, Basiago says Christian of the time. Uh, we know that Washington and most of the other founding fathers actually were, were more likely deists, mm -hmm. probably what you'd call them now. Anyway, um, you're close enough, ha six of one, half a dozen of the other. Basiago says that Washington assumed that he and this other boy were angels. You even asked it several times. You said, well, tell me, you, you are angels, aren't you? And I said, no, sir, we are visitors from your own future. In fact, I was I was given a script that I had to memorize. I, it was basically, I've been 
40 years, but I, I was basically, uh, I had to memorize a script that basically said, uh, General Washington, we are time travelers from your own future, the, the 1970, not the 1770. So 20 years from your own future, or excuse me, 200 years from your own future. Uh, I told him that you are destined to win the war that you are currently waging. It will lead to the forming of a new country called the United States of America. After a period of governance under some provisional presidents, you will be recognized as the first president of the United States and as the father of your country. And that country's capital will be named after you. It will be called Washington District of Columbia. Uh, but none of those uh, propitious things will happen what? if you do not retreat your troops immediately from New York Harbor. Your army will be decimated and you will lose the war. So this is one of the mysteries of some of the missions that we were sent on. We were sent to basically reinforce several critical moments in history, and this was one of them. In the case of going to the Gettysburg Address, that was sort of oh. a treat. It was sort of a privilege that I was given because I had performed ably and well during the first three years of my involvement in the program. A little I, treat. Yeah, a little field trip. Like, oh, good job. You uh, told Washington uh, to stay, to get out of the Hudson. And we're going to pat you on the head and send you over to Gettysburg like a good little boy. Mm -hmm. And he was a good little boy. And, and what little boy doesn't love to see a, a sad consecration of a burial ground from a war? That's well, such a fun, fun field trip. Certainly, especially one from 150 years ago. Yeah. Now, just a moment, Carrie, because I need to find a photo here for you, because I can see, you're trying to conceal it, but I can see the skepticism <laughs> on your face. My face is blank. No, I don't think you really believe that Andrew Basiago was there physically at Gettysburg. I 100% believe it with all of my heart and soul. But if you want to show me a picture, that's cool, too. I was going to say, good, I hope you do, because I'm going to show you right here an image that Josephine Cobb famously took of Lincoln at Gettysburg. It's like the only picture of him, right? Aside from his official portrait. Yes, that's true. And I'm going to direct you over to the left side of this photograph and to that little boy in the circle right there. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, there he is. Looking like a newsie. I mean, indisputably, right? Never mind that we don't know what Basiago looks like as a boy. Indisputably, that is a child or I've, a very small person. I've never seen a picture of Andrew Basiago as a child. Well, and you also can't see the face of this because he's moving and it, photography at that point was shitty. So it's there's no face. Yeah, it's like a tin type photograph. So the boy's face is... Uh, Blurry. Yeah, he's from the crowd in like Madden 96. <laughs> I don't know if that's a game even. Madden 2004. Um, yeah. So wild, wild, wild stuff. <laughs> um, I mean that is that is a young a, a youth at the Gettysburg Address. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Basiago says have something about his shoes. Yeah, he says uh, I had been dressed in period clothing as a Union bugle boy. I had attracted so much attention at the Lincoln speech site at Gettysburg, wearing oversized men's street shoes that I left the area around the dais and walked 100 paces over to where I was photographed in the Josephine Cobb image of Lincoln at Gettysburg. Why was he wearing such big shoes? He, he doesn't explain that, but I think that's the only thing connecting this picture to that story. Mm -hmm. Is okay. the fact that this boy is wearing oversized shoes. Okay. Or appears to be. Again, he's pretty blurry. <laughs> it looks like the focus is, is obviously behind the, the boys and on like Lincoln doing the speech. I mean, that's, yeah, if you're taking a picture of the Gettysburg Address, you're taking a picture of Lincoln. You're not taking yeah. random crowd shots. I just wish we had a little more crispness here on this <laughs> shot of Andrew. It's a shot of Lincoln that he uh, says that he happens to be in, so. Uh, he would occasionally be sent to the same time and place multiple times from different origin points in the future. And he says sometimes the events would transpire slightly differently as if he was being sent back to alternate timelines. Mm -hmm. But he also met himself twice. Mm. And the universe didn't collapse, so... Well, yeah, but, it kind of did. But also, like, so is it sometimes alternate timelines and sometimes the same one your old self went to? We'll never know. I don't know. One of those times he met himself was on a visit to Ford's Theater. <laughs> nothing, n nothing more fun than getting to watch an assassination. Yeah, I wonder if this as was a another, child. I wonder if this was another treat. 
Oh, Jesus. He must have loved it. He went to Ford's Theater. Ver- He's a big My American Cousin fan. Well, he visited Ford's Theater for Lincoln's assassination five or six times, he says. Weird. It, you know, if you're there for the assassination of President Lincoln, it's weird not to remember how many times. It's like rewatching The Office. It's a comfort thing. And I think it's that's another credibility move. Like he's trying to go like, look, I'm so used to time traveling that I... I <laughs> I'm so used to watching this assassination transpire. Like, I know this sounds crazy to you guys, but for me, this is just my world. He said, once I was on the theater level when he was shot and I heard the shot followed by a great commotion that rose from the crowd. It was terrible to hear. So I went back five more times. And while I don't think Basiago himself ever visited the crucifixion of Christ, I do know that he once watched a film that he says a fellow time traveler from the program made with like, you know, I guess presumably an eight eight millimeter camera. Just slyly filming the crucifixion in the crowd? Yeah. And no one being like... no, No one being like, which, which? Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. They maybe they weren't into burning witches yet, so maybe it would have uh, just been like. I think th- I think they were doing plenty. Do you think the Romans would have been freaked by a camera? Yes, <laughs> they were freaked by a guy who could walk on water. It's just an eight millimeter. It's you know. Anyway, um, Andrew did get the chance to watch this film, and he speaks here to its <laughs> literal snuff film that this child is watching. Yes, and he speaks here to its authenticity. He says all of the details from the biblical story were there on the screen. He was very emaciated. He was about about my height, which used to be 5'10". Looked just and like Willem Dafoe. What does he mean his height used to be 5'10"? I guess at this point, which is pretty he, tall for a kid. He's like, he's an older man. He's not that old. He looks older than 61, I, I will say. But uh, should he be shrinking? Oh, I assume he's grown since then. Oh, like he was 5'8 at the time, so maybe he was like 12, which I guess if you're a tall kid, that tracks. Sure. Okay. No, I'm back on board. Okay. Everything he says is true. <laughs> and looks like many of the medieval uh, paintings of, of Jesus. Um, was he white? The women were chased away by a Roman centurion. I saw Longinus, one of those centurions, jump up on his left, uh, on, on, with his right leg and standing on his left leg and extend his arm as far as he could, holding the end of a spear shaft piercing jesus in the side that was a so-called uh spear of destiny being are you just describing paintings at this point <laughs> used to release the fluids that are gathered in, in jesus's uh chest you know cavity um, why is he so gross grew dark at one point so we knew it wasn't a dramatization if it was somebody besides jesus how did so many of the details correspond to the new testament accounts there are three of them of his of his execution what do you mean we knew it wasn't a dramatization because it did. It had all the stuff from the Bible in it. Again, like, like so does the Passion, s- yeah, the Mel yeah, Gibson movie. Uh, Martin Scorsese directed a Christ movie. I'm sure it looked authentic. Oh, okay. No, I finally figured all this out. Thank you. Obviously, Project Pegasus has been in touch with Marty Scorsese. <laughs> and so I Mel got Gibson. an idea. We get a film, a crucifixion. I feel like they wouldn't get along. Basiago and Scorsese. Gibson and Scorsese. Ooh, I'm sure they don't. <laughs> now, Andrew also sometimes went forward in time. Uh, once, at least once, to the year 2045, where he appeared in an emerald and tungsten steel building, where some scientists gave him a canister of microfilm full of important historical information that he was to bring back to the 1970s. Did they, he also get to meet the Wizard of Oz there, too? Because of the Emerald City aspect. Mm-hmm. You're out of the woods, you're out of the dark, you're out of the night. They uh, even dyed his eyes to match his gown. Well, in the future, Basiago also gained knowledge of himself from some career CIA operatives, including, he says, that he would run for president for the first time in 2016. Check that one off the box, because mm-hmm. that happened. And that sometime between 2016 and 2028, he, he, Andrew Basiago, would be elected either president or vice president of the United States of America. Of the the USA, of the actual country, not of like the United States fan club for Project Pegasus or whatever. Yes, nope. Of the US. Okay. So it's coming. I get, eminently. Carrie, there were only two parts of that prediction. One of them came true. So, you know, 
Now, toward the end of the Project Pegasus... <laughs> I don't know. Okay. <laughs> toward the end of Project Pegasus, Donald Rumsfeld, the former Secretary of Defense, apparently told Basiago's father that Andrew would now be inserted at the Naval Academy and uh, graduated as a pretext to attach him to future assignments because they would send him out with the Navy and then he would be in an area where he would have to, I guess, teleport from. Like, why do you need an excuse if you're secretly teleporting him around anyway? Mm Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, Basiago says in high school, he had second thoughts about a military career, and he refused to join the Navy, saying no to both Uncle Sam and his dad. Mm -hmm. But this wouldn't be the end of Andrew Basiago's connection to secret U.S. government projects. It wouldn't be the last time he would use a teleporter. And honestly, (laughs) Carrie, the best is yet to come uh, after the break. Oh, boy. I'm Anne Marie Kelly. Wild Precious Life is a podcast about dreaming big, digging in and connecting across distance, division, and loss. In each episode, I talk with prize winning writers, musicians, and wanderers who remind all of us how we can make the most of the time we have. So meet me here. Let's walk and talk and dream and discover what it means to be wild, precious, and brave. Welcome back. When last we left you, uh, we, well, we had, le- we had just left Andrew Basiago in the middle at the end of his high school career and ready to head off to college after refusing a career in the Navy where he would have gallivanted with teleporters all over the world, um, watching children lose their feet, <laughs> and I guess checking out Russian middle schools. So uh, it was a middle school they were teleporting into when that boy, uh. I don't know why, I think it was a test run. Mm-hmm. Anyway, in the summer of 1980, when he was 19 years old, Basiago attended a three-week factual seminar about Mars at the College of the Siskiyous in California. Now, was this part of his... Undergrad? No, just part of his training, or did he just, you know, do it on his own that he wanted to learn more about Mars? Uh, no, this was he... <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm not sure if he knew what he was in for on this one before he actually showed up. But when he showed up for this three-week factual seminar, it was revealed that the teens were being prepared for actual trips to an existing Earth base on Mars via related teleportation technology to what Project Pegasus had discovered all those years before. If he didn't know about this, it's a hell of a coincidence. What do you mean? Oh, yeah. To just go to this seminar thinking you're going to learn more about Mars and it's another teleportation secret CIA thing? Well, I actually like to think his dad like secretly enrolled (laughs) him in this because he just wants the best for his boy. Yeah, if you're not going to be in the Navy, then you're going to Mars, kiddo. You're going to Mars, bitch. (laughs) Um, This class was apparently taught by Major Ed Dames. He's going for credibility again here, going for a well-known remote viewing advocate. Dames was one of the foremost experts on remote viewing and also a fellow coast-to-coast kook. Mm. Uh, He was actually, Dames was, involved in the Stargate Project, a real U.S. military um, operation back in the 70s. Uh, There was a George Clooney movie called The Men Who Stare at Goats. Mm -hmm. And this was an actual project where the U.S. government looked into whether they could, where the U.S. military looked into whether they could use remote viewing and potentially psychic weaponry. Mm-hmm. Uh, it didn't go anywhere, as far as we know. I think I was one of the five people to see that movie in theaters back in the day. <gasps> Me too. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, we had a we had five dollar movies at our local uh, cinema back in college, which is a crazy deal. I feel like I might have seen it on, under a similar circumstance. Like some every Tuesday, we to went know. to the movies, so I saw a bunch of movies that like no one's ever heard of because we just. Went every week. Yeah. I remember George Clooney being very charming, and and I don't remember anything else. (laughs) Anyway, uh, Ed Dames was involved in the Stargate project, and he was a, I guess, trained through like the first three levels of the remote viewing techniques. But then after that, he was more of a project coordinator. And more than anybody else at 
Stargate, he had a reputation for pushing the remote viewers to like, all right, now show us Atlantis. <laughs> All right, now Mars. Uh, UFOs, UFOs, show us UFOs. Yeah, obviously. You want to see the good stuff. I mean, if we're, we're remote viewing here, right? We're, yeah, we're not... I don't want to see some like old lady in a field. I want to see some aliens. Let's go. Come on. It's just class. <laughs> uh, this class included nine other teen students, including nineteen a 19-year-old Barry Sotoro, mm-hmm. who would one day be known as Barack Obama. Why did he have a different name? Well, he, Obama actually was. This is like, there's, you always have to drop a, a few little crumbs of truth mm-hmm. in. Uh, Obama was like, in, his father enrolled him in school at one point as Barry Sotoro. Mm-hmm. Uh, or his father-in-law. Uh, he, he was enrolled in school in like Indonesia at one point as Barry Sotoro. Mm-hmm. In real life. In real life. Mm-hmm. Not Andrew Basiago life, in actual <laughs> real life. In Basiago life, 19-year-old Barry Sotoro, um, then a student at um, one of the nearby universities, Berkeley, maybe. Um, Didn't he go to Harvard in real life? For law. Oh, so that was... He's 19. This yeah, is his undergrad. undergrad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, but I don't, I'm not sure where he... I'm not sure where he actually went, but it was somewhere... It was somewhere around there. Mm-hmm. And also there was future DARPA head under Obama... Regina Dugan. Mm. Another member of the class was apparently four, um, another member of the class was apparently now 54-year-old William B. Brett Stillings. Okay. Um, he's about five years, five or six years, six or seven years younger than Obama and um, Basiago, so he would have had to be a very young member of this program when the other two were 19 coming in. Mm-hmm. According to Basiago, at least seven parents who had CIA ties were also there to audit the class, including Basiago's own father, of course. Of course. With all his teleportation experience. And Obama's mother, Stanley Ann Dunham. Alfred Weber, our old friend, the lawyer who writes that ExoPolitics blog. Mm -hmm. He points out that Dunham, Obama's mother, carried out assignments for the CIA in Kenya and Indonesia. It's It's starting to feel problematic. It's almost certainly not true, Mm -hmm. but um, it it has been thrown out there. (laughs) Sure. A lot's been thrown out there. We weren't going to start talking about Barack Obama without this conspiracy getting problematic somewhere, right? Yeah. Basiago says he was roommates with Sotoro for a couple of days, and Obama was reading document briefs that the CIA had given them to groom Barry Obama for the presidency. Why didn't he get the same documents if he's supposedly becoming president? Well, wasn't close enough. Basiago's time's not for a, a lot longer, you know, so you're not going to give both the guys the docs all at once. Okay, sure. Uh, but he says Obama was like a CIA-approved president. Mm-hmm. Maybe Basiago's not a CIA-approved president. Okay. Maybe that's the key. Sure. These teens traveled back and forth to and from Mars with technology that Basiago calls the jump room. We would go and you would sit in this room and then zap, you would be teleported to the jump room up on Mars. To what end? What are they supposed to be doing on Mars? Uh, Well, U.S. Martian facilities in the early 80s were pretty sparse. You know, uh, Basiago describes it as something like the construction phase of a rural mining project. Uh, Our exopolitics friend, Alfred Weber, points out just based on, you know, the amount of time it's been and uh, population growth rates and stuff, um, that could be 500,000 people by now up there. It's like, we got a half a million person colony on Mars, Carrie. This lawyer told me. And it's secret. Uh, And it's secret. (laughs) Now, at the time, Ed Dames told his students, of 97,000 individuals we have thus far sent to Mars... Only 7,000 have survived there after five years. What happened? Well, it was a dangerous place. The students were provided with respirator and weapons training before they left. The weapons were to defend, apparently, against Martian predators. There were giant, monstrous predators roaming the surface. The respirators were to protect them from the Martian atmosphere, but Basiago says he only wore his on his first jump, and after that he felt it was unnecessary, so... Uh, I'm I'm not totally sure. I'm not totally sure why. Was he in some sort of bubble? Were they in an enclosure? No, he talks about Obama just walking across like the Martian terrain. 
With no respirator. No respirator. I don't think so. He says the purpose of the installation was to protect Earth from space-borne threats and to establish a legal cover for an eventual U.S. claim on Mars by sending civilians up there. You know, so eventually America could just go like, look, we've got half a million Americans on Mars. I guess it's ours. I mean, that's the most real sounding thing I've heard so far. Uh, For sure. (laughs) Um, It was also, of course, and this will be obvious to you, Carrie, to get Martians used to the Earthling presence. Dames told... Just these monsters or their actual, like, human-esque aliens? No, there were humanoid Martians that they also had to uh, interact with. Okay. Dame said, simply put, your mission is to be seen and not eaten. It's a fun bit. Um, Now, Stillings, this other guy who says says Basiago's story was true and says he was there. Oh, so this guy vouches for him. He's like another witness, basically. Okay. He came out a couple of years ago and said, no, it's real. Mm -hmm. Me too. Mm -hmm. Um, He says he once exited the jump room and saw Barry Sotoro standing there by himself, staring blankly into a Martian ravine. Mm -hmm. He says, quote, I can confirm that Andrew D. Baziago and Barack Obama, then using the name Barry Sotoro, were in my Mars training course in summer 1980. And during the time period 1981 to 1983, I encountered Andy... Courtney M. Hunt of the CIA, and other Americans on the surface of Mars after reaching Mars via the jump room in El Segundo, California. Mm-hmm. The Gundo. <laughs> Taking it to the Gundo. <laughs> Basiago, for his part, recalls seeing young Mr. Sotoro walking past him on the way to the jump room. This is where he said, across the Martian terrain. Mm-hmm. And he says, the tall, handsome teen said with a, quote, sense of fatalism, uh, get, let me get, get my Obama impression on here. Uh-huh. We're here. That's it? <laughs> Wait, why is it such a thing that he's looking at a ravine and walking and saying we're here? Like, okay. I don't know. Here's my theory on that. I think uh, that... A sense of fatalism. We're here. Like, I, what? I think Basiago and this other guy both think that it... They want to say that they personally witnessed Barack Obama on Mars... But they want to keep the story super believable. So they're like, I didn't interact with him much. There's nothing I can say that can be debunked. Just at one point in this three-year span, I definitely saw Barack Obama look into a ravine on Mars. And say we're here because those are two words we know Obama knows. We're here. (laughs) Basiago says, two years later, when he was taller, thinner, more mature, a better listener, using the name Barack Obama... And attending a different college, Columbia University, we crossed paths again in Los Angeles, and I didn't recognize him as the person that I had been trained with in the Mars program and encountered on the surface of Mars. In fact, doing so would have been virtually impossible in any case. This is where he sounds like he's making it up as he goes. (laughs) He's like, what? And you know what else? Doing it would have been virtually impossible in any case, because measures had been taken to block our later memories of Mars shortly after we completed our training in 1980. So how does he remember it? I don't know. Oh, boy. He doesn't explain that. But maybe that's also why he only has those little little tiny snatches of memory about, uh, you know, B-H-O. Stop. <laughs> After his claims about Barack H. Obama got him a bunch of pull with the most gullible of right-wing conspiracy fringe, all of the... Because 2012 was high birther time. I remember the days. <laughs> um, so after, Against my will. So after he started actually getting a bunch of traction on the internet with this, Andrew Baziago started making noise about running for president in 2016. Now, he initially thought about seeking the Democratic nomination, he says, but when he found out it would cost about $5 million to get on the ballot in all 50 states, he was disgusted. Mm-hmm. And he decided to run as an independent write-in candidate instead. Mm-hmm. And here, Caroline, I'm going to. I think this is the best way to do this. I'm gonna. We're gonna go through a few of uh, Mr. Basiago's campaign platforms from 2016. Please. Um, I will tell you. Unfortunately, he, he like he said he was planning to run in 2020, and indeed, in as you heard, every election year until 2028, 
Um, but Ballotpedia has no record of him registering after the 2016 election. So I don't think he actually ran in 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, and Andy2016.com now exclusively consists of a block of plain text. <laughs> Andrew D. Basiago is a prominent figure in the truth movement. For more than 10 years, he has shared with the American people the true facts of our great nation's accomplishments in time travel and Mars visitation. More than 10 years. He has done so as one who served bravely in the two secret U.S. defense projects in which time travel on Earth and voyages to Mars were first undertaken. As a result of his courageous advocacy as a crusading lawyer... Oh, he's a lawyer, by the way. That that hasn't come up yet, I don't think, but uh, apparently he's professionally a lawyer. Andy is credited with ending the time travel and Mars cover-ups by the U.S. government on behalf of the American people. This arduous work in the vineyards of the truth movement Repre- the vineyards represented historic breakthroughs in America's understanding of our past and our prospects for the future. Today, Andrew D. Basiago is running for president of the United States with a new agenda for a new America. He has vowed that if elected president, he will lead the American people into a bold new era of truth, reform, and innovation as great as they are great. Join us in supporting Andy in his quest to establish a presidency as honest, just, and ingenious as the American people. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what what's his platform? Okay. Aside from truth, you know, like uh, quotation marks, vague. Well, I got all these fun, um, you know, kind of issue stance uh, banner, not ads. They were images from his website, andy2016.com, before it went away. Uh, mm-hmm. I was able to sleuth around the internet and find a bunch of these. And uh, I... I think I want to watch the look on your face as you discover these. Mm -hmm. So uh, would you be comfortable with me having you cold read Andy's uh, policies? I'm very comfortable. Okay. Okay. Start right there with the first one. Ending homelessness in America. Oh, this sounds great. Yeah, I mean, I, that's a great thing. In January 2015, 564,708 Americans were homeless on a given night. Of that number, 206,286 were people and families, and 358,422 were individuals. About 15% of the homeless population, some 83,170, are considered chronically homeless. We can and should end homelessness in America by adopting Utah's approach of, first, giving the homeless immediate shelter in modest apartments and houses, and then second, where drug and alcohol addiction, mental health, and unemployment are the cause of their homelessness, intervening to help them with their personal problems. This is actually uh, true. Utah is using this approach, and as of 2020, had basically eliminated their homeless problem. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm with it so far. They literally just throw up apartments, and then like after people are in them, they have to get involved in drug programs and, and stuff, mm-hmm. and then they, try, they help them find work. They just take away all the problems that, that made them homeless in the first place. Right. Um, it's interesting. And that's like a blood red state. Yeah, this is very not red. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a good liberal solution to a, to a liberal problem. And... Um, well, to an everyone problem. Yeah, but I mean, liberal in the sense of... It's a liberal solution to a universal problem. Yes, Disclosing secret advanced technologies. Oh, now we might be veering a little bit. We, he started okay. off on such a good note. So maybe maybe he's got something here. This is probably going to be um, boilerplate presidential stuff. For 70 years, the U.S. government has been concealing advanced technologies because they might be socially, economically, or technically disruptive in nature. These technologies include the teleportation oh. technology uh-oh, developed by DARPA's Project Pegasus. They may also include cancer cures. What? Just throwing that in there. Uh, the government should begin a program to declassify and deploy this knowledge. The standard of technical disclosure should be what provides the people the best available technology. This will enable the United States to reclaim its mantle as the world's catalyst of applied science. Again, I'm not I'm not against this. I think there are certain medical and technological innovations that have not been publicly released. This is conspiratorial, but I think it genuinely is true because it, it like would... What, do you think like cancer cures are out there? No. No, because I think that's something so huge. That you'd make all the money in the world if you had it? Yeah. I Well, not even that. I just... 
I think there are certain innovations that haven't been publicized because people would lose money. Um, I don't know. I don't know if they're very, they're not, I don't think they'd be as big as a cancer cure, but you know, like certain stuff. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about um, hydroelectric cars mm-hmm. or like solar powered Hi- Hydroelectric? Cars. It's got a little dam in it? It's something like that. <laughs> Maybe just water powered cars, but like stuff that would be so much less costly to everyone, but obviously it would be worse for everyone else people making other cars gas companies stuff like that you're right it, it sounded like he was just railing on on his uh, teleportation time travel bit again but um maybe that was more reason than i gave it credit for i, th- I think we're still okay he I, didn't mention mars or teleportation or anything he did mention teleportation did, and project he, pegasus he mentioned project pegasus but if you don't know what it is then it's like whatever right He's, i think he said the teleportation technology <laughs> but now we're getting into uh, yeah, yeah well, let's see if he'll write the ship what's the next uh what's the next plat- plank here carrie ending chemtrail spraying by the u.s <laughs> so yes. now we're solidly in conspiracy thought The chemtrail program was the brainchild of Dr. Edward Teller. Teller advised if we sprayed aluminum and barium oxides in the upper atmosphere, this would enhance the albedo effect, the reflectance of solar radiation back into space from clouds, snow, and sand. This, he hoped, would stem global warming, which by stopping the Gulf Stream may threaten us with a new ice age. The chemtrails, however, have led to widespread respiratory distress. The president should end chemtrail spraying by U.S. agencies by executive order and pursue technical innovation to end global warming. I agree with the last part. We need to end global warming. Yes. I don't think. (laughs) Yes. Finish the thought. That it's chemtrails. Uh, Yes. Listen, we have to cover this at some point, I'm sure. I don't think there's enough to chemtrails. Chemtrails starts and ends with people looking up at the sky and going, what's that stuff coming out of planes? (laughs) I mean, I think there's a little more. But Do you? It it just seems like something that we would cover at some point. But yeah, there might not be a lot there. Um, we need to end global warming. I do agree with that. Absolutely, so absolutely. I'm, I'm not. If he if he could prove that chemtrails were just causing respiratory issues, then um, okay, I'm kind of with it still. D- does he have any other environmental policies, Carrie? Yes, protecting the Sasquatch species. The best. I mean, this is this is a noble man. And I love his blurb on this, too. Sasquatch exist. I know. I am the first U.S. presidential candidate since Theodore Roosevelt, oh, too. Can I just note here? I didn't notice before that uh, he he's using the, uh, the singular plural, Sasquatch. Mm-hmm. Sasquatch exist, like saying moose exist. Mm-hmm. I am the first U.S. presidential candidate since Theodore Roosevelt to declare publicly that I have encountered Sasquatch. T.R.'s encounter, Theodore Roosevelt's encounter, occurred when a Sasquatch was scared into his campsite one night when he was on his great North American ape expedition. I encountered an adult male Sasquatch and his young son, oh, that's so cute, while I was camping at Lake Sacandaga in the Adirondacks in 1966. He was having a busy 60s, he was. Oh, yeah. He was only five. Yeah. That's when he saw an adult male Sasquatch. (laughs) Okay. The Sasquatch... played with a young son. (laughs) The Sasquatch have matrilineal DNA that is human and patrilineal DNA from an unknown primate. How does he know this? He tested that... When he was a five-year-old boy, he (laughs) tested that young Squatch. The president should protect the Sasquatch by putting them on the endangered species list. No. Nowhere here does he say that they actually have dwindling numbers. That's the only... (laughs) Here's the thing. If they do exist... They don't! If they do exist, yeah, they should be protected. I'll say it. Listen, I agree. I agree completely. (laughs) I don't know if they exist, but if they do... I don't think Andrew's head is in the right place, but I think his heart is. He doesn't seem like a bad guy. And listen, this is actually the funniest one to me. Oh, more than the Sasquatch. Read it. And, And we'll have to get a little bit in. Investigating the computer and software fields. Well, on the face, I agree with that. The president should ask the Office of Technology oh, Carrie, Assessment. Be a little bit angry. Like, be really angry. This is the one you can tell he's passionate about. <laughs> okay. The president should ask the Office of Technology Assessment to investigate technical decline in the computer and software fields. For example, why Microsoft, after perfecting work... <laughs> Stop. <laughs> 
I fucking love Clippy. After perfecting Word in its 2003 version, substituted it with a far inferior version in Word 2007, and why Toshiba has introduced PCs with faulty basic functions, like copy-paste that has copy functions that collapse while paste is being attempted. Is there a plot to make computer use in the U.S. slower, less functional, more cumbersome, less efficient, more time-consuming, less productive, and more aggravating? That is what we have seen. Listen. Andrew. Qui bono. <laughs> I think everyone can agree that things literally just aren't made like they used to be. Microsoft Word? No, uh, just no, just things in general, like fridges, stoves, appliances, you know. My uh, grandma has a fridge that she's had for like 40 years or whatever. And meanwhile, you know, her one at home, uh, this is... You know, the, the Jamesport one is probably like 40 years old. The one at home is uh, they had to replace after, you know, 10 years or whatever. Most people are finding out that like toasters don't work as well as old toasters, you know. Now is some of that new technology that is more apt to be buggy, like smart toasters and such? <laughs> sure. But there is a there is a widespread belief that things are just made more to break now within like five years. So you have to keep replacing it. And I think, yeah, that's not, that's not so crazy. I think a lot of our shit is just obsolete now after like any electronics is basically yes. just obsolete after five years, except video game consoles. They're, they've moved into like 10 year cycles. Yes. Now I can't compare word 2003 to word 2007. I don't have the same emotion behind it that Mr. Basiago seems to have. Um, but I mean, it is a it is a belief that things are people think that things are made now to become obsolete or to break or whatever within a much shorter period of time. So people have to keep buying new items to replace those. And that seems just like capitalism to me. Yes. It will grant it all of that. But this is only here because this he was... is because he's pissed about word. <laughs> And his Toshi shitty Toshiba PC, yeah, apparently. Just, just imagine him sitting there with like a $250 Toshiba laptop and just cursing at it. <laughs> like copy-paste that has copy functions that collapse while paste is being attempted. Like, you know that's that's a specific thing that that he was dealing with probably while making this graphic. I wish, well, yeah, it was when he was doing the Sasquatch <laughs> one. It just kept... Fuck, shit. Encountered, encountered. Fuck. <laughs> copy-paste. <laughs> There's... <clears throat> There is good heart in a lot of these platforms. Some of these are great ideas. Ending homelessness, obviously. Protecting Sasquatch. If it's real, yes. Just like the giant squid should be protected. Oh, I, I have not seen a reference to Teddy Roosevelt witnessing a Sasquatch, by I've the way. I've heard about that before. I don't know if it's... No, I tried to track it Legit. down. I think he might have just said once that they might exist. Like, that's different was, from... I mean, yeah, he, he seemed to have like a whole story there. But, you know, even if Teddy did say that he thinks that it existed, it does make Andrew Basiago the first candidate since then to also agree with that. Yeah. I think he has his heart in the right place. I think his mind is all over. Yes, no, no question about that. <laughs> In Teddy Roosevelt's memoir, he says, a grizzled, weather-beaten old mountain hunter told him a story while shuddering about witnessing a Sasquatch. Well, if Teddy believed it, he believed it. I think Teddy was the kind of guy who loved a spooky story. Yeah. Um, why do I keep, whenever I use your computer, this is uh, unrelated. Oh, <laughs> Is this part of Basiago's campaign platform? Uh, yeah. Well, you, these targeted ads, actually, that would be him in 2020. It's all about the, the targeted <laughs> ads he's angry about. Why did those, some of those seemed a little bit outdated, right? Like, why was he still mad about Word 2007? <laughs> in 2016? Because his base is probably using Word 2007. So this is actually savvy politics. Mm -hmm. All right. I love it. Uh, well, that's Andrew Basiago, folks. I think that's all I have on him. That's that's pretty much all there is to say at the moment. Hopefully, you know, I'm still crossing my ring fingers for a run in 2024. But <laughs> sure, um, throw him in there. Well, whatever. Do we know how many votes he got in the uh, write-in votes in the 2016 election? Boy, what a good question. Give me one moment. I mean, I gotta ask. 
according to thegreenpapers.com, Andrew, Daniel, Andy, Basiago, in 2016, received, for a total of 0.00% of the popular <laughs> vote, Okay. 86. Fair on him? The news today is us. Ooh. It is. It's true crime time. No, I'm kidding. This is the, this is like the monster <laughs> at the end of the book. <laughs> it is. No, it's like the version that you incorrectly remember. It's a Mandela effect. I'm telling you, there was a mirror, and you're the monster at the end of the book. I'm not the only one who remembers this. No, because Grover's afraid the whole time. The irony is that it turns out he the was... The monster at the end of the book is you, the reader. No. Grover's afraid of himself. I'm just telling you, I used to read that book at my grandma's house and grandpa. I'm not a monster! <laughs> I know I'm not. Grover. That's why I was so shaken by this. Grover is literally a monster. It was the first time I encountered monstrosity within myself, and it made me think a lot. No, it's the irony of <laughs> Grover's fear of the unknown other. Uh, listen. Anyway. Deep themes. <laughs> yes, the news this week, as you may have noticed, this is our 99th episode. Oh my god. Oh my gourd. And and with the couple of like unnumbered weeks we've had and like little bonusy things. It's uh, pretty much two years. We we have done two years of this podcast and I'm so uh excited about that. Bamboozled. So bamboozled, where did the time go? I don't know. <laughs> if uh, it just it feels like we were just doing the roast to roast for the fiftieth. Yeah, except I do I do feel two years older than that, and yeah. that was only one year ago. <laughs> yeah, and that was like after COVID had started. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah. Anyway, yes, so next week is our 100th episode, and uh, we've teased it a little bit on social media, but what we will be tackling for our special 100th and probably 101st and 102nd episodes. Yes, uh, almost certainly a three-parter. We wanted to make, uh, we wanted to tackle a really big story, a, a big big story that we hadn't covered yet. Um, and something that actually happened, unlike this week. Yes. I think the most the most equivalent would probably be the Salem Witch Trials. I mean, Satanic Panic was our biggest series. Oh, no, there was the Axe Murders, but those were so you know somewhat different stories. But this is one story, and we will be covering Jack the Ripper. No, no, no. Saucy Jack. <laughs> Dear boss. <laughs> So as you, I'm sure you know who Jack the Ripper is, listener. Um, he was a killer known to have probably killed five sex workers back in Whitechapel, starting, I think, all in uh, 1888. Yes. Um, and Whitechapel was in London. It was a, a bad place to be. Um, so we'll be covering the crimes of Jack the Ripper, the theories behind uh, suspects and motive, and also some of the weirder conspiracies surrounding this strange, mysterious figure. Did the royals do it? Did the masons do it? Why not both? <laughs> Royal masons, we're done. So yeah, so I'll be back uh, next week. I'll be hosting, uh, you know, taking us through the, st the first part of the story, at least. And um, yeah, I'm coming in for the fake shit at the end. <laughs> and we'll be celebrating our big 100 slash two years. So That's right. Oh, and don't I know I know I know a bunch of you cut out of here before the end of the episode. As soon as you hear Carrie say that's it for you're you're done. You're out. So so just stay here. Don't admonish our I, listeners. That's not, that's not going to make them stay. Yeah, sometimes they need a little admonish. Yeah, I'm trying to keep them in line, for Christ's sakes. <laughs> um, we have, Caroline, this is very exciting. We have a call-in line. We have just established a call-in line, much like your coasts to coast. We are the art bells now to you, dear listeners. The arts bell. The arts bell. The George's Nori. <laughs> Um, our official number, and this is a, a Google Voice situation, so don't try and trace us or whatever. Uh, uh, yeah, and I think we're going to turn, like, if we answer you, then you're not going to get to be on the podcast because we need to, we need a voicemail to be recorded. So, yes. uh, so, so we're going to turn the ringer off on this thing. We're never answering this phone. <laughs> this is a voicemail. Well, we might do some live stuff in the future, but oh, right, yeah. right now, 
If you would like to call in and leave us a message, call 203-666-5529. Again, that's 203-666-5529. And we'd love you to leave a message about your favorite uh, subjects or episodes that we've covered these last 100 forays into the strange and bizarre. Um yeah, we would love to do that. We'd love to, to put together maybe some clips of favorite moments if you guys have any. Uh, and, you know, just don't leave, like, leave us anything mean, please. Well, the voicemail is <laughs> a lot of effort. Surely they would have just done a review or a comment by now. Yeah, well, I don't know. Anyway, 203-666-5529. That's Ain't It Scary on Google Voice. Leave us a voicemail. And, um, you know, if you're cool with it, we'll play it on the show um, or we'll, we'll play the clips that you mention, or, you know, if you have any well wishes for our hundredth, anything you'd like us to cover really just whatever's on your mind. Um, give us a call. Yeah. And maybe someday we will, you know, never not funny. Uh, one of my favorite podcasts. I have a, a glazed commemorative plate right here to <laughs> prove it. Um, never not funny. We'll do uh, call in episodes where they'll, I would love to do coast to coast style stuff. They'll tweet out that they're recording you know what I mean? It doesn't have to be a live stream. You tweet out that you're recording, and then and then if anybody sees the tweet, they give you a call. Yeah. So, We're definitely going to do a clip show type of thing for Patreon, so get on over there if you would like. There's more to come, certainly, soon. Um, but yeah, share share your favorite moments, your favorite clips, your favorite topics, anything you want us to cover, literally anything that comes to mind. Just give us a call and leave a message. We would love to hear it. 100%. Thank you. Danke schön. That's it for this episode of Ain't It Scary with Sean and Carrie. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Ain't It Scary and check out our website at ain'titscary.com. You can support the show by supporting our sponsors and becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash ain'titscary. And please subscribe to the show and throw us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. We'll be forever grateful. Yeah, and we'll probably start giving out the phone number at this point as well, but mm-hmm. definitely give us a call. 203-666-5529. I think they got it a minute ago, but th- th- sure. Uh, <laughs> Just making sure, baby. And special thanks to our beloved top tier patrons who we certainly want to hear from. Nate Curtis, Sean O'Donnell, Jared Chamberlain, Maria Ferrante, Robin McCabe, Comfy Mike, Alex Nakutis, Ryan Regan, Christy Atchison, Ira. See you next Thursday. Show created by Sean and Carrie McCabe. Music by Kyle Ryan. You can find Kyle at his YouTube channel, Music is a Verb. Ain't It Scary has been brought to you by Killer Podcasts and is a production of Longboy Media. I'm Anne-Marie Kelly. Wild Precious Life is a podcast about dreaming big, digging in and connecting across distance, division, and loss. In each episode, I talk with prize-winning writers, musicians, and wanderers who remind all of us how we can make the most of the time we have. So meet me here. Let's walk and talk and dream and discover what it means to be wild, precious, and brave. 